Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the third episode of our program called Voices of Veterans, in which we hope to bring you testimony of veterans, also historical facts about veterans and the United States' involvement in various wars all over the planet, and uh, the continuing uh, trials and tribulations and all of the things that are happening to veterans that, that need to be addressed today. Today we're going to uh, listen, hear some voices from some books that I've put together from veterans of the Afghanistan war and Chechnya. These are Russian veterans now. These are not United States veterans. But I feel that there's an interest in, this, in, other, in these voices. And also, they have something to offer to a lot of us. So for some of that, we need, to hear, we need to know some of the history of what's happened in Afghanistan, even up till the present time. For instance, Alexander of Macedon was one of the first European conquerors to get to Afghanistan and invaded them over 1,000, 2,000 years ago, and uh, was one of the few people that you could probably say actively conquered Afghanistan, even though he left after a while, too. And Afghanistan has been a critical player in the great game of war that was waged all over, the, all over that area in Asia by Russia, the, the Russian Empire, by the British, the British Empire, and today by the United States. So I think it's incumbent on us to know some of this history and to know what the people of Afghanistan themselves have, have gone through as, as part, of the, uh, part of this historical warfare that's carried on in their nation. In fact, a lot of people don't even understand how, what the tribal setup in Afghanistan is like. In fact, people think that there must be the Afghanis must be the tribe that is in Afghanistan, but that's not true. There are four main tribal groups in Afghanistan. You have the Pashtuns, you have the Hazara, you have the Tajiks, and you have the Uzbeks. And all of these groups have their own histories, their own ethnic languages, their own beliefs, and not all of them are considered, consider themselves to be Muslims. However, the Pashtuns, which are also in Pakistan, make up the majority of the population in Afghanistan. And they, and they are also have tribal loyalties and tribal beliefs that are you know, inherent to their culture. And one of these is called Pashtun Wali, which is basically what we would call a blood debt. If you, if you injure or hurt one member of their family, then the rest of those families take out that blood debt on you. So this has been part of their history that we are really not uh, um, aware of and we haven't studied. And this is similar to what happened to us in Vietnam. We went into a country that we knew very little about. And now we've gone into Afghanistan and we know very little about what happened in that country. So I'm going to give you some, uh, some of the insight that Russian veterans have about what happened in Afghanistan. Now in 1978, the government of Afghanistan was collapsing, and they asked the Soviet Union to send in troops to help prop up their government. So in 1978, three years after the United States got out of Vietnam, the Russians went in to Afghanistan with their armies. And for the next 10 years, until 1988, they waged war all over Afghanistan on the people of Afghanistan. And young Russian soldiers were conscripted, similar to American American soldiers being drafted, and they were conscripted into the armies to go do what they call their international duty in support of the Afghan government. I'm going to read from a book now that's called Afghanistan, a Russian soldier story, text and photographs by Vladislav Tamarov. I also, while I was working at the library, had a, was able to pick up this book, but I also was privileged to meet two Afghanites. Afghansi, as they're called, which were Russian veterans of the Afghan war. And one of them, who was from the Ukraine, actually said to me when we were talking one day at the Mark Twain Library, he said to me that he was ashamed of what his country did in Afghanistan. So now I'm going to give you some of the words of one of the veterans of the Afghan war, a, Russia, a young Russian. It was my first day at peace, the first day that I didn't hit the dirt at the slightest rustle, that I didn't have to hide in the shade of the trees, holding my gun at the ready. The first day that it was possible to simply walk along the road, not thinking about anything at all, without having to look down all the time to avoid being blown up on a mine. It was the first day I came back from Afghanistan. I walked out of the airport, sat down on a park bench, and opened my notebook on the last page. Here was my little calendar on which I'd crossed off every completed Afghan day. 
unhurriedly enjoying the moment I drew my last 621st cross on April 24, 1986. When I was drafted into the Army in April of 1984, I was a 19-year-old boy. The club where they took us was the distribution center. Officers came there from various military units and picked out the soldiers they wanted. My fate was decided in one minute. A young officer came up to me and asked, do you want to serve in the commandos, the Blue Berets? Of course, I agreed. Two hours later, I was on a plane to Uzbekistan, a Soviet Republic in Central Asia where our training base was located. During the flight, I learned most of the soldiers from this base were sent to Afghanistan. I wasn't scared. I wasn't surprised. At that point, I didn't care anymore because I understood that it was impossible to change anything. To serve in the Soviet Army is the honorable duty of a Soviet citizen, as it's written in our Constitution. And no one gives a damn whether you want to fulfill this honorable duty or not. But then I didn't know anything about Afghanistan. Up until 1985, in the press and on television, they told us that Soviet soldiers in Afghanistan were planting trees and building schools and hospitals. Doesn't that sound familiar? And only a few knew that more and more cemeteries were being filled with the graves of 18 to 20 year old boys without the dates of their death, without inscription, only their names on a black stone. At the base, we were trained and taught to shoot. We were told that we were being sent to Afghanistan not to plant trees. And as the building schools, we simply could, wouldn't have the time. We were told that there, would, there we would be defending the southern borders of the Soviet Union as well as the Afghan Revolution. Three and a half months later, my plane was landing in Kabul, the capital of Afghanistan. When I stepped off the plane, the first thing I did was look for the skyscrapers. After all, it was a capital city abroad. But instead of skyscrapers, I found only reddish, faded mountains. We were taken in a club on base. A few minutes later, officers started to come by and choose soldiers. Suddenly, an officer with a smiling face and sad eyes burst in noisily. He looked us over with an appraising glance and pointed his finger at me. Aha! I see a minesweeper. And that's how I became a minesweeper. Ten days later, I went on my first combat mission. Now I'm often asked if I thought the war was a just war when I was there. How can I answer? I was a boy who was born and raised in quiet, beautiful Leningrad, a boy who loved his parents and went obediently to school, a boy who was yanked out of that life and dumped in a strange land where there was a real war going on where life followed different rules. And the most important rule was simple. Only those who kill first will survive. There, we didn't have smart thoughts. We shot at those who were shooting at us. We killed those who were killing us. In our company, there was a board on which were written the names of those who perished and the dates. During the 20 months I served in Afghanistan, five more names went on the board, three more black days. April 17, 85, Alexei Kondrashev. May 25, 1985, Alexander Zaychenko. July 19, 1985, Sergei Zaitsev. Alexander Kravchenko, 19. Yuri Demyanets, 19. These were all 19-year-olds. They were blown up by one mine while checking a road. They were 18 and 19 years old. At home, their mothers were waiting for them, mothers who had given birth to them, who carried them in their arms when they were small, who woke them up to go to school, who wouldn't do anything when their sons were taken into the army, who, wouldn't, who couldn't do anything when, instead of their sons, they were presented with a form, your son perished while fulfilling his international duty in Afghanistan. I wrote this paragraph and I thought, why did I write it? Simply, it was very painful for me to read these names once more as they were written here. Now our troops have returned from Afghanistan. Now our government has announced that the war was a mistake. Now I think about the results of this mistake. Tens of thousands killed, hundreds of thousands of bodies crippled and fates twisted. That is the only result of this war. What can any war give aside from such results? I flew home to my native Leningrad. Only one day separated me from Afghanistan, but it already seemed to me that it had been some kind of terrible dream. I fell asleep with this thought that when I awoke, the war would remain in my dreams and it wouldn't haunt me anymore. When I awoke, the plane was coming in for a landing. Through the window, the lights of my city were visible, the city where I hadn't been for two long, hard years. I had dreamed about this moment for 621 days, that is, for 14,904 hours. You notice how he keeps track of every day and every hour. When we were in Vietnam, we used to talk about 
365 days in a wake-up. That's how long most of us would be there, except for the Marines, who had to do 13 months instead of 12. I wanted my homecoming to be a surprise, but right before I reached out, right before I reached out, reached my street, I became say, scared for my mom, and I called her up. Mom, I'm alive. I'm in Leningrad. I'll be right there. And I hung up. I don't remember what happened when I got home. I couldn't take anything in. I remember only that everyone cried. And when I woke up in the morning at 6 o'clock on the dot and saw my familiar wall walls, my cat curled up at my feet, I understood that it was over, that Afghanistan was in my past. And a sharp pain went through my heart. I wanted to bang against the walls, drop everything, and go back. Go back there where I knew my purpose, where I knew the value of life, where I was needed. To this day, I still have Afghan dreams from which I awaken in great pain and sadness, but it's too late to go back or to bring anyone back. I am asked a lot, was it terrible for you there? It's a complicated question. The first year and a half, I didn't think about it. I just didn't think. It was more like a curiosity. Bullets whip up the little fountains of dirt all around you a few centimeters away, and you're lying there, and all sorts of absurd, silly thoughts keep the current. Wow, that was close. I've got to write home about that one. Only not to my parents. I'll write my friend. But our casual attitude is not out of bravery or courage. No, it's probably simply that we lived alongside death all the time. And when you live next to death like that, you don't think about it anymore. You just try to encounter it as seldom as possible. Some call us heroes. Others call us killers. Why? We are the veterans of the Afghan war. Afghansi. That word says it all, simply. There we had our own life, another life, and we lived it as best we could. That life we lived by other values, other criteria. In one battle, an ordinary soldier, Alexander Corvier, covered my commander, Lieutenant Ivonin, with his own body. Posthumously, Alexander was awarded the title Hero of the Soviet Union, which must be similar to our Congressional Medal of Honor. But do you think at that moment he thought he was performing a heroic act? He simply was defending another man's life with his own body. Sometimes, too, one has to kill for the sake of saving another life. That is war. We didn't invent it, but having been at war, we understand the meaning of the word, and all the more dear to us is that word, peace. And what's the point? if some 17-year-old kid calls us a killer and that gives out that light night and then gets out that night and beats up another like himself. One, the three against one even. That's why I don't believe words. Afghanistan taught us to believe actions, not words. These guys were tested in action. Everything was up front and clear, but not everyone was able to stand up to the test. Some people consider all Afghansi wonderful guys. From others you'll hear, Afghansi? Oh yeah, one of those types. Why do they want to hunt, uh, lump us all together under our cliché? Afghansi, it is not a profession, not even a calling card. It's simply a name. Not everyone should, not everyone can bear this name. We had a sergeant in our company who fulfilled his staff duties 100% and even more. For cleanliness and orderliness, our company was simply the best, but he never went to battle, our sergeant, and he never fired a shot, unlike all the others, and he went home with a battle medal. Why? I don't understand it myself. In the United States, there are 186 psychological rehabilitation centers open to help Vietnam veterans. But where are we in the Soviet Union to go for help? We don't even have one such center. And we, so we look for that kind of help from people. That is where we run up against misunderstandings. From these misunderstandings come the high divorce rate among Afghan vets. From these misunderstandings come the turning inward into oneself. For many, the inner battle takes the form of an angry protest against the un unfamiliar. But why? Better to try to understand a person than to protest against that which is strange and foreign to you. I myself did a lot of break dancing when I came home from Afghanistan. I worked in a professional dance troupe. For me, break dancing is a language without words, one which I can speak freely, a language of movement. But in order to speak that language, you have to work. We had to work very hard. And many people were surprised. Surprised. You're an Afghanitz and you're breakdancing? One time, our dance group met with the Yale University Slavic Chorus, which sings beautifully in Russian and English. English. We went to see them off at the Moscow Railroad Station. We started dancing for them there on the platform. And they began to sing us Russian songs. It was unforgettable the way that the whole Moscow Railroad Station clapped 
for us. But when it had gotten to the point, to the train and gone, I saw one young guy who had been watching them with a, with a rage and fury so strong that I couldn't stop myself from going up to him. Then I heard him say, I was in Afghanistan, and these ships, they're, they're, they're rockets. I felt pain and some sorrow for him. He was blaming the American people for the American rockets. The American people, who I'm sure, like the majority of us, sincerely want peace and hate war. Not long ago, I took part in a meeting of Afghan vets and American Vietnam vets. Among them was one American who had lost both his legs in Vietnam to Soviet rockets. And he had come to this meeting to help Afghan vets maimed in the Afghan war by teaching them to make prosthetic devices. What else is there to say? Often I am asked, did you get used to death over there? No, I never got used to it. You can't get used to it. It's impossible to get used to it. But I returned home, and I'm glad we are returning. For the Russians, the war in Afghanistan ended on February 15, 1988, when they came back over the bridge from Afghanistan. And some Vietnam veterans have gone to Russia to work with the Afghans, and here, is a picture of, Alec, of Vladimir Tamarov and John Messmore at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. There are two veterans in this picture, John Messmore, a Vietnam veteran, and Igor Zakharov, an Afghan veteran. Two veterans from different countries who came back from different wars at different times. But there's something they both share that unites them and which others can't understand. When I came to Washington, D.C., when I come to Washington, D.C., John always meets me and I stay with him. It's good that we met here, he told me once. It's good that we didn't meet over there. So this is one, this is the voice of one veteran, a Russian veteran. And I think you can see that a lot of the things that the Vietnam veterans felt are felt by the Russian veterans. And it's, a very, it's, it's, a, it's an oddity, in fact, that during their war from 1978 to 1988, we supplied the Mujahideen, which is what they called them, the Afghan fighters that were fighting the Soviets, with Stinger missiles and M16s and weapons to kill Russian soldiers. And just a couple of weeks ago, the commander of the American forces in Afghanistan let it be known that the Taliban, who are now our current enemy, along with so-called Islamic terrorists, were being supplied with weapons, AK-47s, DSK machine guns, and rockets by the Russians to kill American soldiers and NATO soldiers. The full circle that we need to break from is very, becoming very apparent and should become more apparent to the people of the United States. But the war in Afghanistan was just one of many conflicts that veterans were involved in in Russia. This is another book called One Soldier's War by Arkady Babchenko. He fought in the wars in Chechnya. And he was drafted the first time at the age of 19. And then he re-enlisted and went back. And this book has a lot of similar type facts in it and similar type feelings that you would say that you would say would, would replicate what Vietnam veterans feel today. No one returns from the war, ever. Mothers get back a sad semblance of their sons, embittered, aggressive, beasts hardened against the whole world and believing in nothing except death. Yesterday's soldiers no longer belong to their parents. They belong to war, and only their body returns from the war. Their soul stays there, but the body still comes home, and the war within it dies gradually, shedding itself in layers, scale by scale. Slowly, very slowly, yesterday's soldier, sergeant, or captain transforms from a soulless dummy with empty eyes and burned out soul into something like a human being. The unbearable nervous tension ebbs away. The aggression simmers down. The hatred passes. The loneliness abates. It's the fear that lingers longest of all, an animal fear of death. But that, too, passes with time. And you start to learn to live in this life again. You learn to walk without checking the ground beneath your feet. 
your feet from mines and trip wires, and step on manholes in the road without fear, and stand at your full height in open ground, and you go shopping, talk on the phone, and sleep on a bed. You learn to take the granted the hot weather and the taps, the electricity and the central heating. You will no longer jump at loud noises. It's funny that some of the same things that stress out Vietnam veterans are, are the same things that stress out the returning veterans from Chechnya and Afghanistan. About a million military personnel passed through Chechnya in the 10 years after the start of the first war in 1994. That's the population of a large city, 50 divisions of seasoned soldiers who bring back their philosophy, the philosophy of war, back to civilian life with them when they return. Ave Caesar, moratori et salutant. Hail Caesar, those who are about to die salute you. Why did you fight, brother? And why are you here? Did you ever think that Dubrovka siege in Moscow was, was payback? These veterans sometimes sit in the, in the subways in, in Russia, and want, they sit together as a group. They say, half truths are everywhere, half sincerity, half friendship. I can't accept that. Here in civilian life, they have only half thoughts. And the small measure of truth we had to war was a big lie. So many boys died, and I survived. I get up silently, and I leave him cigarettes, matches, and vodka. There's nothing else I can give him apart from money. I walk away without saying anything, and he doesn't even look at me. For him, I am also one of them, which means whatever I say is a half-truth. And he says, I am just a reminder of what has happened. And in some ways, that's what we're here for. We're here to remind you of what happened to us. And one thing that I'd like to remind you about is something that my brother veteran Steve Fournier told me about today. In, in June 8th of 1967, the USS Liberty was steaming out of Port Said, Egypt. This was a United States destroyer flying its flags fully identified as a United States military vessel. As it streamed out of Port Said, it was being watched by the Israeli National Security Agency. And they sent out two fighter jets to strap the deck of the USS Liberty. 34 American sailors were killed that day by the, by the Israeli military. And these are the little known facts that, are not, that the American public doesn't pay attention to. And there's a documentary on, on uh, the internet that you can watch about the USS Liberty and what happened to them. And for that reason, I think there's a lot of, a lot of people who should mark the things that have happened in the United States history and what we're all involved in today. We need to remember our history. We need to listen to the voices of the veterans and to their families. Next week when I come back, I'm going to be talking about post-traumatic stress syndrome and what that does to veterans of, of all the wars that we've been in and how it actually changes the structure of the brain. We have some interesting new facts to talk about with that. We also have some new uh, medical facts done by Dr. Jonathan Shays, talks about the PTSD and, the, and moral wounds, moral injuries caused that are internalized, not caused by a physical wound, but they're just as deadly and just as traumatic. So we hope to, we hope to uh, bring you more information and hope to bring you more Voices of Veterans on the next episode, which will, will probably be airing in a few weeks. Thank you very much for your attention, and we hope that you will continue to watch this program and listen to the Voices of the Veterans.